temperature of something, you are measuring the kinetic energy of the atoms or the molecules in whatever you're taking the temperature of. So if something that has a high temperature, those molecules are moving faster than something that has a low temperature. Okay? So when you heat something up, you're making the molecules move faster, which makes sense when we think about our different states of matter. Remember, solid, liquid, gas. As you heat it up, it's going to melt and they evaporate. And as you go from solid to liquid to gas, the molecules move faster and faster. The partner to kinetic energy is potential energy. And potential energy is a, a little more difficult to, to, to grasp. But potential energy is the 
potential to get kinetic energy. And that is based off where something is located. So if I hold the marker up here, what's going to happen when I drop it? It's going to fall. And when it falls, it starts moving, right? So if it starts moving, it's going to gain kinetic energy. So it has the potential to get kinetic energy just when I drop it. Okay? If it is on the floor, it has no potential energy. Because it can't fall further than the floor. At that point, it has no potential energy. As I raise it up and up, higher and higher, the potential energy is going to get larger. Because you know the longer something falls, the faster it falls, right? When I first drop it, it falls slowly, but when it hits the ground, it's moving a lot faster. If I held it up here, when it hit the ground, it would be moving either, even faster. So the higher something is, the more potential energy it has. Chemical energy is a type of potential energy. The, the energy that is stored in molecules that gets released when they react or when they burn is a type of potential energy. It's not as clear cut as how high the marker is or being able to visualize if I drop this, it's going to start moving. The chemical energy is potential energy. So looking at these two pictures is based off the universal markings of speed shadows. Which of those two pairs of molecules do you think has more kinetic energy? Okay. Why do you say A? Longer trails. Longer trails, which somehow you know means it's moving faster. Because in reality, nothing has trails. And so why does a longer trail mean it is moving faster? I don't know, but that's what cartoons taught us when we were three, and so that's what we know right now. Because our reactions generally deal with heat as the energy that they're using or they're giving off, we have to talk about units of heat. And so heat in itself is energy that gets transferred from one thing to another because of a difference in temperatures. So if I have a hot thing and a cold thing and I touch them to each other, which way do you think the heat is going to go? hot to cold, right? Heat goes from hot things to cold things. So it's like a gradient. Exactly. When you put them together, they're going to, temperatures are going to come closer and closer until they're at the same temperature, right? If I put the marker in a cup of ice water, the temperature of the marker is going to rise until it reaches the temperature of the ice water, and the ice water temperature is going to come down to, towards the marker until they reach the same temperature and then they'll stop. In chemistry, in this class, we are going to talk about heat and energy in two different units. Joules, which is just a capital J, and calories, which is abbreviated CAL. Okay? One calorie equals 4.184 joules. That is on your cheat sheet but you'll probably use it so many times in the next week that you'll remember it for the rest of your life. To make things tricky, because nutritionists and because doctors, no matter what they want to tell you, doctors are not scientists, doctors and nutritionists use a calorie that has a capital C instead of a lowercase c. Scientists came first, I guarantee it, okay? We came up with calorie with a lowercase c. A calorie that is on the nutrition label is a capital C. A capital C calorie is a thousand regular calories. Okay? A lot of people, and we'll, we'll, we'll do it in here, call them big calories and little calories. Okay? A little calorie is that. In terms of the amount of energy in that, that's not a whole lot of energy in real life, okay? Once you multiply it by a thousand to get to a calorie with a capital C, now we're talking about something that can really do something in, in real life, okay? So a ca calorie with a capital C 
is a kilocalorie. If you go to Europe or Canada, their nutrition labels might say kilocalories. Some of them actually have joules instead of calorie with a capital C. If you see a problem, whether it's on homework or a quiz or an exam or a final exam, and it says calories, the first thing you need to do is look at that C. Figure out if it is a capital C or lowercase c. Anything that we do in this class in terms of calculation will need to be the lowercase c. But if you're given it in a capital C, you just need to multiply it by a thousand to get to the lowercase c. So one big calorie equals a thousand calories and it's the same as one kilocalorie. So this label comes off some sort of cereal based on the ingredients organic whole grain wheat, organic evaporated cane juice, and natural flavor. It's probably some hippie Trader Joe's stuff that costs about $10 a box. Not the kind of cereal I eat, but then look at me. Okay, this says one serving is 190 calories. Notice that that calories has a big C. Okay? Question is, what is the energy content in joules? Okay? And our conversion factors are this. So we need to convert 190 big calories to joules. I suggest using dimensional analysis like, to do the conversion like we learned the second week of the year. So we have 190 calories. What unit goes down here? What, sorry, oh, what, what unit? Small yeah. Big calories. Big big calories. calories. Yeah. We need to cancel the unit. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Where do you want to go from here? Yeah. Yeah. The easiest thing to do is to go from, go from big calories to little calories. And so a thousand little calories is one big calorie. And so little calories is going to come down here. What do you want to put up here? Joules. Joules. And so 4.184 joules equals one little calorie. Answer up here. Yeah. So when you do that, you'll get 7.9 times 10 to the fifth, which is 790,000 joules. 790,000 joules. Which is why the nutritionist decided to use something much bigger than a standard calorie or a joule. Because one bowl of cereal has 790,000 joules. You don't want to have, if you're trying to keep track of how much you eat, you don't want to be counting how many million of something that you're eating, right? And so they, they had a good intention. They just shouldn't have taken calorie and just made it a capital C. So we're going to take those units. You know, type the problems that you're mostly going to use them in are what we call specific heat problems. You know, if, I, if you take something and you put heat into it, the temperature of that object is going to change, right? If you put heat into an object, would you expect its temperature to go up or to go down? Up. If you put heat into something, it's going to get warmer. Where it gets tricky, though, is that it how much warmer it gets depends on what it is made of. Let's catch. Some things, if I put five calories of energy into, the temperature's going to go way up. Other things, if I put five calories of energy into, the temperature's barely going to change. What's something you can think of that changes temperature very easily? If you go out into the midday afternoon sun, what do you not want to touch outside? Yeah. Metal. Metal changes temperature very easily. If you put energy into that metal, the temperature is going to go up by a lot. That you certainly know. OK? 
And then you think of something based on experience that you don't think changes temperature as much. Water. Water does not change temperature nearly as much. Think about the lake. It's 95 degrees out, but that lake is probably about 80 degrees, and even though the air temperature above it goes between 70 and 95 over and over and over again every day, that lake stays right about 80 degrees. It has to be hot out for a long time to get that water temperature to rise on this lake. So specific heat is how much heat it takes, or how much heat you have to put in to take one gram of a substance and raise the temperature of that one gram by one degree Celsius. Okay? So it's essentially like a price tag. It's how much energy do you have to put in to get one gram to increase by temperature by one degree. And that is specific heat. The units on specific heat are going to be joules per gram degree Celsius or calories per gram degree Celsius. The units work themselves out when you see how it's, how it's calculated, but in reality it makes sense. It's how many joules you need per gram and it's how many joules you need per degree Celsius you want to heat it up. So when you break it down, it makes sense, but in reality you're going to be given specific heat usually and it's already going to have that unit on it. That's not a unit you're going to have to pull out of a hat on an exam or something. Water. Specific heat of water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Does that look number look familiar? It's the conversion between calories and joules. Which is why that conversion is weird. A calorie is just how much energy it takes to raise the temperature, to raise one gram of water, one degree. Okay, so they just figured out how many joules does it take to raise one gram of water, one degree, and they figured out it's 4.184 and said, well, let's call that one calorie. Because every, a lot of things in science are based on water, right? Water is everywhere. And so if you can figure out the energy that you need to change temperature of water, you can base everything off of that. So the formula that we're going to use is here. This is one of the few formulas that is not on your cheat sheet. Okay? It will not be on your cheat sheet for the quiz next week. It will not be on the cheat sheet for the exam this is on. And it will not be on the cheat sheet for the final exam. Okay? It is delta H equals M C delta T. If you look at it, I kind of see M cap. It's M C delta T. And delta H is heat. Specifically, it is the change in heat. And we'll talk about more what that means in a minute. M is mass. This capital C is, is specific heat. And then delta T is the temperature change. So if you know what you're, what the material you're working with, you're going to know the specific heat. You'll look it up or it'll be given to you. You'll know the mass of it. And so you can say, if I want to raise the temperature two degrees, how much heat do I need to add? Or if I take that material and I need to get 50 joules out of it, how much do I need to decrease the temperature? So this is literally just a, you have four variables, three of them will be given to you, solve for the fourth one. So our first problem is how much heat do you have to add to 15 grams of water if you want to increase the temperature from 25 degrees Celsius to 75 degrees Celsius. So we have to be, then have been given three of those four variables. Which one are we trying to solve for? Heat. We're trying to solve for delta H. So what is M? 15.0 grams. What is C? It's not given to us. Specifically here, 
but it's, it's the specific heat of water, which the previous slide said was 4.184. And even though we had to have it memorized for this, you would not have to have that memorized at any point. Okay. And now we've got delta T. You need to calculate delta T. The delta T is not given to you directly. It's how much, what the change in temperature is going to be. Is that what you want by what you have? It's the final minus the initial. So it's the final minus the initial. In this case, the final temperature is 75.0, the initial is 25, and so our delta T is 50.0 degrees Celsius. Okay. If you remember final minus initial, the positive or negative on your answer will work itself out. Okay. But a lot of times the numbers are going to be nice, easy numbers you can do in your head. So you look at that and you say 25 and 75, obviously there's a 50 difference between them, right? So if you don't want to think about, well, what is my formula? Which do I have to actually subtract? Because the problem could, could go from 75 to 25. You think the temperature is going from 25 up to 75. We know it's 50. If it's going up, it's positive. Okay. So you get two options. Actually, do the math here. Let the, the sign figure itself out. I use a little bit of logic. Okay. It's a kind of a question-dependent thing how easy it is and whether you're comfortable doing it. So now we've got delta T, delta H. All we have to do is plug them in. 15.0 times 4.184 times... 50 points, and you'll get N. When you do it, you get 3140 <coughs> joules. Okay. The specific heat that we used was the joules per gram degree Celsius. If we had used one that was calories, per gram degree Celsius, our final answer would be in calories instead of joules. Is that not the number you're getting? I got 3138. Well, six figures. You got 3138? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so three six figures. Oh. And so... You said 3138, right? So you dropped it to zero on, even though it's not counted? Correct. Because if you drop to zero, then it's 314, okay. which is a lot different than 3,100. Change it to be zero. Correct. Okay. You have to put the zero there as a placeholder so that you get 3,000 and not 300. So that's one type of an example. Second one, when the heat change when 15 grams of water cools from 75 to 25. What's going to change here? The only thing that can change is this is going to flip around. So it's going to be 25 minus 75, which is negative 50. Or just looking at it, we're going down from 75 to 25. It's a difference of 50, and it's going down, so it's negative. You can just add a negative to the Right. So because that's not negative, that becomes negative. And so that becomes a negative. If something is cooling off, delta H is going to be negative. If something is heating up, you want to be putting heat into it to be making it heat up. And so delta H is going to be positive. Make sense? In these equations, they don't have delta H. They have Q. Q is the same as delta H. Okay? If you see on Canvas, on a Wiley, on a quiz, on an exam, on a final exam, the Q instead of the delta H, don't let you, that trip you up. Delta H 
in Q are the same exact thing. To me, delta H is easier because it actually tells you what it is. It's delta, delta means change, H is heat. Where the heck did Q come from? I don't know. Here's another example. We've got aluminum. We're given the specific heat of aluminum. We have 156 grams of it at 75, and we're cooling it to 25.5. And the question is asking, how much heat is transferred? So, what is my equation? It's back all the way. Delta H equals M times C times delta T. That's delta. <laughs> Believe me, it's a delta. Which of those four variables are we trying to solve for? Again, we're looking for delta H. So we have to be given the other three. What is M? 156 grams. What is C? 0.895 joules per gram degree Celsius. And what is delta T? 49.5. 49.5, which came from 75.0. The final is 25.5 minus 75.0 equals negative 49.5. Temperature is going down, and so it's going to be negative. So we just plug them in. Delta H equals 156 times 0.895 times negative 49.5. Negative 6.91 times 10 to the third joules. So a little less than 7,000 joules. So that's how much heat is transferred. What is the sign on our Q or delta H? Negative. negative. And what does that negative mean? It means it is losing that much. Which makes sense. It cooled off, right? Something that cooled off lost heat. Now you have to think. Okay? You have to think about what is really meant by specific heat. Remember, it's how much heat it takes to raise one gram, one degree. Okay? So you have chunks of aluminum, copper, and lead. All three chunks are 50 grams. So the mass of all three materials are the same. You're going to add one kilojoule of heat to each of them. So the only thing that's different is what they're made out of. It says, which would increase in temperature by the greatest amount? How many say aluminum? How many say copper? How many say lead? Okay. Test making strategy, if it's the greatest one, it's either going to be the highest one or the lowest one. It's never going to be the middle one. Because the middle, the middle one is going to give you a, a change of somewhere in the middle. So if you've got no idea, pick one of the extremes. Okay? So we said, Specific heat, its definition is how much energy it takes to raise a, a gram one degree. It's like a price tag. A low specific heat has a low price tag. And so for the energy that you put in, you get a lot of temperature change back. You get a lot for your money. Okay? That's one way to look at it. And so if you want a large temperature change, you want a low price tag. So which one is going to give you the largest temperature change? Lead. 
Okay? That's the logic way of looking at it. We can also look at it mathematically. Our equation is delta H equals M C delta T. If we solve this for delta T, we get delta H divided by M divided by C. Right? For all three of them, delta H is the same. So we can ignore that. The mass is the same. So what we get is that delta T is proportional to the inverse of specific heat, which means if specific heat goes up, delta T is going to go down. So if we want delta T to be big, do we want C to be big or little? Little. So we want the smallest specific heat. That specific heat. Questions on that? Okay. You, those are very nice questions. So you're going to see quite a few of them, both where you actually have to calculate something and type the questions where you have to do the thought type of a thing. Okay. We're done with the energy there. We're going to move on to gas. Okay. We're going to talk more in depth about the states of matter. Gases, you'll see, are much more interesting than solids and liquids. Gases, you, I could talk for multiple weeks just about gases. Okay? What you're getting this semester is even cut down from what I've done in the previous semester. We're going to do liquids and solids combined next week and it's like 21 slides. Okay? Liquids and solids don't do much. Gases do a lot. Okay? So in the video, if you happen to watch it, we started to talk generally, I think just generally about properties of gases. So gases, we have pre pressure with air pressure. We have volume. So why is volume important for gases but not solids and liquids? not definite. You can very easily change the volume of a gas. And then we're also going to have temperature. Okay? I think in the video we talked about what pressure is. Anybody who watched the video think they can explain what pressure is and what causes air pressure. If I have a balloon, there's pressure in that balloon. And that pressure causes the balloon to expand. And this boils a lot. Kind of very similar, yeah. Exactly. On the molecular level, it is literally just the gas molecules in that balloon hitting the inside of the balloon. And when they hit the edge of the balloon, they push it out a little bit. But molecules are small, so to fill a balloon, you have a lot of them. Right? A mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. So at any given time, you have a lot of molecules hitting the inside of that balloon. And so the more molecules you have hitting the inside of that balloon, the more it's going to push out. So the pressure is just the, in, the molecule on the inside hitting the wall. Like yeah. a scuba tank? Kind of yeah. yeah. Put it, a lot it, of air in. Yeah. It pushes out on the tank. Right. If you have a scuba tank, the more air you put in, the more molecules that are in there, so at any given time, more of them are hitting the tank. <coughs> if you put enough in, they hit with enough force that they're going to bust the tank open. So, with that in mind, looking at those two pictures, and what we learned in, when we were three in cartoon, which one do you think has the greater pressure. Assuming they're at the same temperature. B. Why B? Because there's more, more of them. There's more of them. Why does them being at the same temperature matter? Because when they heat, they, they, they go faster. It expands because they go faster. We said temperature was a measure of kinetic energy. 
And so, if you heat a gas, the molecules are going to move faster. And so even if you have the same number of molecules in there, if they're moving around faster, they're going to hit the wall more often, and when they do hit, they're going to hit it harder. So if you heat a gas, pressure goes up. You know that, right? If you have something, if you have a water bottle, and you cap it, and you heat it up, it's going to blow up. You know that, right? And your tires on your car, when it gets hot out, pressure goes up. When it gets cold in the winter, you have to put more air in because it got cold and the pressure went down. In this case, it's the same temperature, which means that they're heating the wall at the same frequency. They're not hitting it any more often as any individual molecule. And when they hit, they're hitting it with the same speed. So the only difference here is there are more of the atoms or molecules. So because there are more atoms, the wall gets hit more often, and there's more pressure. So, like everything, pressure has its own units. In scuba tanks, you probably use PSI, right? In America, we use PSI. There's no good reason to use PSI, okay? PSI is hard to work with unless you're just reading a gauge and you know what is full and what is empty. So PSI is pounds per square inch. That is pounds per square inch. It is literally telling you how much force the molecules are exerting on the inside of that tank for every square inch of tank. That's literally what it's telling you. In science, we don't use PSI, okay? We use millimeters of mercury and atmospheres, okay? If you check the weather forecast, they're going to give you the atmospheric pressure. Do you know what unit they're going to give it to you in? We're just, the, 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 even ignoring the number, just the units. When they, if you log on the Weather Channel website, look at the atmospheric bar barometric pressure, what is the unit that they give you? It's not PSI. Inches of mercury. Does that sound familiar? No. You were looking it up? No. no. <laughs> it's, it's inches of mercury. Okay. Inches of mercury, where the heck does that come from, right? Old barometers were literally a glass dish with mercury in them, and then kind of this upside down graduated cylinder. The higher the atmospheric pressure, the more force there is pushing on the mercury down here. And you can imagine if you push on that, it's gonna force it up that glass tube. And so inches of mercury is just how many inches off the tube the mercury is gone. Is that how thermometers work, the old ones, because it's heated up? Those are working because of the mercury actually expands. So as it expands, it has to go up. <coughs> but because we're scientists, we don't use inches. And so instead of using inches of mercury, we use millimeters of mercury. Okay. We also use tor. A tor is the exact same thing as a millimeter of mercury. One millimeter of mercury equals one tor. They're interchangeable units. They mean the exact same thing. And then we have another unit, atms or atmospheres. Okay? One atmosphere is, in general, what the normal atmospheric pressure is. So that's where they make that baseline. One atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury. That's on your cheat sheet, but it's another one of those numbers that you're going to use so many times that you're not going to need it on your cheat sheet. Because a millimeter of mercury and a tor are the same, one atmosphere also equals 760 tor. Another unit that you will not use is pascals, PA, or kilopascals, or the thousand pascals. One atmosphere is a whole bunch of pascals. So you only use pascals if you're dealing with very, very, very low pressure. So 
there are a number of things that we can change about a gas that are gonna, going to affect their properties. We're, we're going to have these different things in equations. Okay? I've changed the order that I'm teaching this, this semester. We're going to see what happens. The way I used to do it is introduce all of the little equations first, and then do examples for all of them as we went, and then get to the end, give you a combined big equation and tell you if you remember this one, you don't have to remember any of the little ones. What we're going to do now is we're just going to go through them all, not do any examples until we get to the end, the big one, so that if you want, you can just remember the big ones and never have to worry about the little ones. So we've got volume. Volume, we're going to measure in liters, okay, or milliliters. It's not going to matter. You, you'll still see that. Either liters or milliliters. We've got pressure. We're going to use atmospheres or tor, one or the other, but in most cases, it's not going to matter. And you, again, you'll see what I mean by that. And we'll also have temperature. This one, the units are going to matter. Temperature has to be in Kelvin. Absolutely has to be in Kelvin. If you use Celsius, you're going to get the wrong number. And it has to do with the type of conversion between Kelvin and Celsius. Do you remember how to go between them? You either subtract or add 273.15. Okay? In our equations, we're going to be dealing with ratios. Did the temperature double? Did the temperature quadruple? What happened to it? Mathematically, if you add the same number as the top and bottom of a fraction, that fraction does not stay the same. If you multiply the top and the bottom by the same number, the fraction stays the same. So because the conversion between Kelvin and Celsius is addition and subtraction, you have to use Kelvin. Otherwise, these ratios will not work. And the last thing is going to be amount of particles, and that is going to be measured in moles. All of these equations that we're going to learn deal with ideal gases. I think the very last slide talks about what we mean by an ideal gas, but in general, ideal gas is on paper. In real life, gases aren't going to behave perfectly like these equations tell us they should. But in real life, in our setting, in our lab, it's going to be so close that we can't tell the difference between reality and the ideal gas. Where things really go haywire is at very extreme temperatures and very extreme pressures, which we can't do in our lab. So this is a graph of volume versus pressure. Just standing back and looking at that graph, what can you tell me between the relationship between volume and pressure? As pressure rises, volume decreases. As pressure goes up, volume goes down. They are inverse. As volume goes up, what happens to pressure? It goes down. Volume and pressure are going to be opposites. Okay? Imagine your balloon. If you have a balloon and you put it inside of a container that has very high pressure, it's going to push in on the balloon and make it contract. High pressure is going to decrease the volume of that balloon. This is another way to look at it. This is a, a piston system. This is, imagine having a syringe. Have you ever had a, like a syringe and you put your finger over the, the cap of it and you try to push down on the syringe? What happens? It starts to go down easily, and then it gets really hard to push. It's because as you decrease the volume, the pressure is going up. So there's more pressure pushing up on that plunger, so you have to push harder and harder to make the volume go down. So if we start in this scenario, and this is what our molecules look like in here, if we push down on that plunger, there's now half as much volume. The same number of molecules, but half as much space for them. And so they're going to hit the walls a lot more often. If 
they hit the walls more often, that means pressure goes up. So as you close the container, as the container gets smaller, what's in the container hits the wall a lot more often, which pushes that, try to push that piston back up. This is Bode's law. This is one of those little equations, which if you find this helpful, you can use this equation, okay? Boyle's law tells us that pressure is proportional to the inverse of volume, which is fancy math speak for saying pressure and volume go in opposite directions. As pressure goes up, volume goes down. As volume goes down, pressure goes up. Pressure goes down, volume goes up. You see the pattern. Right. If you work out some algebra, you do all this math, and you end up with this equation. P1, V1 equals P2, V2. In the equations we're going to have here, we're going to have ones and twos. Ones mean before, twos mean after. So we're going to be dealing with changes. Okay. We're going to start with a sample of gas with a given pressure and volume. We're going to change one of the two, and we can figure out what the other one changed to. Okay? So we know the starting pressure and starting volume, and we know the final volume, we can find the final pressure. I've rearranged it for you, but you don't need that. Using that idea, tell me why this bag of lightly salted potato chips are puffier at greater volume, or are puffier, meaning greater volume at higher altitudes than at lower <coughs> altitudes. Less atmospheric pressure where? In the upper, right? So imagine you have your gas in that bag, and the gas molecules are pushing out. If you have high atmospheric pressure, there's the air trying to push in on that bag. If the air pressure is higher than the pressure inside the bag, the outside molecules are going to win. And they're going to push in on the bag. As you go up a mountain or up in a plane, atmospheric pressure decreases. At higher altitudes, atmospheric pressure decreases. And so there's less force pushing in on the bag the same amount pushing out, though, and so the bag gets puffy. Why did I specify lightly salted potato chips? Salt has nothing to do with it. It's to make you thankful that I don't put crap like that in my exam questions. Because there are professors that do. I know them. I don't do it. You're welcome. <laughs> this is another relationship between two things, temperature and volume. You know this. If you have a, a thing of gas and you increase the temperature, what happens to the volume? It gets bigger. If I have a balloon and I heat it up, it's going to expand. If I cool that balloon off, it's going to shrink. So what would you say is the relationship between temperature and volume? Assuming pressure doesn't change. Do they go the same direction or opposite direction? Same direction. Same direction. As temperature goes up, your volume is going to go up. This is a balloon. At room temperature. Here they're pouring liquid nitrogen onto it. It makes the balloon very cold. The air inside shrinks. So the balloon shrinks with the gas. This is Charles' law. Okay. Temperature, as temperature goes up, volume goes up. If you do the math, it is completely proportional. Volume is proportional to temperature. If temperature doubles, volume doubles. If volume gets cut in half, that means your temperature must have gotten cut in half. Okay. Again, you do some math magic. This is the equation for Charles' law. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Remember, T1 
1 and T2 have to be in Kelvin. People who write exam questions like to give it to you in Celsius. You can't use it in Celsius. You have to convert it to Kelvin first. There's also a relationship between volume and amount of gas. This one is maybe the most obvious of all of them. If I have a balloon and I put more gas into the balloon, does the balloon get bigger or smaller? Bigger. As I blow into the balloon, I'm adding gas, the volume is going to get larger. This one is called Avogadro's Law. It says V is proportional to N. N is number of moles. Okay. We're going to see that N in our equation here. N is number of moles or just moles. This works out. V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. And it's proportional. If I have a balloon and I let out half of the gas, what happens to the volume? It decreases by half. I now have half as much volume. A little extra side part to Avogadro's law, and it, it's side, but it's still important. This is something you're going to have to know. Is that an ideal gas, and what we call STP, and I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. If you have one mole of gas, one mole of gas takes up 22.4 liters. Okay. You can round that 22.4 if you want. <coughs> and it doesn't matter what type of gas it is. In all of these equations, it doesn't matter what type of gas you are using. All gases behave exactly the same. Because a gas is almost all empty space. And remember, there's very few molecules in a gas because they're so far spread apart. So these laws apply to any gas. This STP is standard temperature and pressure. Standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius. Standard pressure is one atmosphere. That's on your cheat sheet. Okay? You don't have to memorize it, but zero and one is pretty easy to memorize. So if you have one mole of gas, and that gas is at zero degrees Celsius, and at atmospheric pressure, one atmosphere, that one mole of gas is going to take up 22.4 liters. And to give you a little bit of context, one mole of water weighs 18 grams, that's 18 milliliters. We've done enough stuff in lab, you probably have an idea of how much 18 milliliters is. With the 100 milliliter graduated cylinder, that's the plastic one, it's about that big around, that's about that much. That's not much volume, right? But if you take that water, boil it so that it becomes a gas, and then cool it down zero degrees Celsius, but somehow prevent it from turning back into a liquid, condensing, that 18 milliliters of water is going to take up more than 22 liters of volume. Gases take up a lot of space. This is the Pronus equation at the end. This is the combined gas law. It is literally just the other three stuck together. Okay? You have P1V1 over N1T1 equals P2V2 over N2T2. Ones are before the change. Twos are after the change. This is on your cheat sheet, okay? On the cheat sheet, the ends are not there, though. It's P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. If you want to use the combined gas law for something that has ends, it's up to you to remember where the ends fit in, okay? So we can use this equation for any gas law change. Okay? If we have something, a problem, that involves 
pressure and volume, but it has nothing to do with mold or temperature. We literally just erase N and T. If we erase N and T, what we're left with is P1, V1 equals P2, V2. And that would boil the wall. Okay? So if you start with this one equation and erase the variables that have nothing to do with that problem, you'll have the equation that you need to use. The beauty of the Hermann Gass law is that if multiple things change at the same time, you can do it all in one calculation. If temperature stays the same, but pressure, volume, and moles change, you just plug your starting ones in here, your ending ones in over here, and solve for the one you need. You don't have to do individual three different calculations. So this is an example of using it for Boyle's law. The Boyle's law we started P1 V1 or P2V2. If we go back, that's just the top part here. We said P1 V1 over N1 P1 equals P2 V2 over N2 P2. This is our first gas law problem. Pressure of a 2 liter sample of gas is decreased from 1.2 atmospheres to 0.25 atmospheres at constant temperature. What is the new value? I would suggest, starting with the combined gas law, is pressure involved in this problem? Yes. So we can't erase it. Is volume involved in this problem? Yes. Is temperature involved in this problem? It's mentioned, but it says constant temperature. And so T1 and T2 are going to be exactly the same. So mathematically, they're not going to make a difference. And so we can erase them. Is number of moles part of this problem? No. So we erase that, and we're left with P1V1 and P2V2. So we have four variables. Which of those four variables is the one we're trying to solve for? We're trying to find the new volume, which is the final volume, which is V2. So V2 is our unknown, so we have to be given the other three. What is P1? One point two atmospheres is our initial pressure. What is our initial volume, 2.0 liters, and our final pressure is 0.25 atmospheres. So we just plug them in. We have 1.2 times 2.0 equals P2 is 0.25 times the solve for V2. 1.2 times 2 divided by 0 0.25 equals 1. We've got 1.2 times 2, 2.4, 9 point thank you. 9.6. What do you think my unit is? Liter. Why liters? You started, you started with liters. For volume, the unit that you put in on the one that you know is the unit you're going to get out on the one you don't know. If we converted 2 liters to 2,000 milliliters, we would have gotten milliliters out in the end. Okay? For pressure, we had atmospheres over here and we had atmospheres over there. We could have used tors or millimeters of mercury. The trick is you just have to have the same unit on both sides. We can have atmospheres on both sides, or we can have tors on both sides. We can't have atmospheres on one and tor on the other. So, if you're given a problem that has one in atmospheres and one in tor, you have to pick one of the two and convert it to the other one. But it doesn't matter which way you go. Here's another one. Put my combined gas law back up here.
We have some carbon monoxide. It's 150 milliliters at 25 degrees Celsius. We're going to cool it at constant pressure until it occupies 100 milliliters. What is the new temperature in degrees Celsius? So, is pressure involved in this problem? No. So I'm going to erase my pressure. Is volume involved in this problem? Yes. Yes. Volume is changing, so I'm going to leave it up there. Are number of moles involved? No. no. So I'm going to erase N. Is temperature involved? Yes. yes. So now we have four variables. Which of the four variables is the one we're trying to solve for? T2. T2 is our unknown. So we must know V1. What is V1? 150 milliliters. What is T1? 25 degrees Celsius. What is V2? 100 milliliters. Plug them in and go. Got to change the temperature to Kelvin. Cannot use 25 degrees Celsius. So I'm going to add 15 equals 298.15 Kelvin. Now I can plug them in. So got V1 150 divided by T1 298.15 equals V2. 100 divided by T2. So T2 part about these gas flow problems is figuring out what it's asking you. Because they're all going to be worded differently. So it's a matter of reading the problem, figuring out which variables you're given, which ones are involved in this problem, and then which one are you looking for. Make your list, convert, if you have to convert, plug them in. If algebra, if this algebra is easy for you, these gas law problems should be very, very easy. They should not be hard. If algebra like this is difficult for you, you want it to not be difficult for you. Okay? That is your biggest thing here. I see so many people do this right and then they can't solve for a variable. Okay? And so make sure you know how to do this algebra. Um, don't you have on the slide, since you started with Celsius, do you have to convert it back to Celsius, or is the Kelvin okay to leave it like that? Oh, questions. What is the new temperature in degrees Celsius? So yes, we did have to convert it. So we subtract 273.15 to get negative 74.4. This is, this is going to be the last slide. This is Avogadro's law. We've got T1, V1 over N1, T1 equals T2, V2, N2, T2. Is pressure involved here? No. So I'm going to erase pressure. Is volume involved? 
Yes. So I'm going to leave B. Is N involved? Yes. Yes. I'll leave that. Is P involved? Yes. No. So I'll erase P. We've got V1 over N1 with V2 over N2. Which of the four variables is the one we're solving for? V2. We're looking for V2, which means we have V1. What is V1? 8.2 liters. 8.2 liters. What is N1? 0.35 moles. Or 0.35 moles. What is N2? 1.2 moles. Do I have to convert anything? No. no. Now plug them in. 8.2 divided by 0 0.35 equals V2 divided by 1.2. 8.2 times 1.2 divided by 0 0.35 equals what? 281. 281? Yeah, that's not, yeah, not going to be 28.11. Where's my unit? Moles. Or no, 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 no. Liters. liters. We're solving for volume. And for volume one, we put in liters. And so we get out liters. We have two sig figs. So it's 28 liters. I'm not going to cover the slide. Don't panic. I just want to see what's So I think we've covered everything you need for the homework this week. We'll, next week, we'll finish these slides, and then we'll also do the next set. There are only like 20-some slides, so we'll get through all of it just fine.